Well, thank you everyone for the warm welcome. Um, and it was great meeting uh, so many of the grad students at lunch this afternoon. And uh, yeah, I remember sitting in this, these uh, colloquia myself uh, very well. And uh, what a nice opportunity it was to get some outside speakers. And so uh, I feel honored to get to stand on the other side of things and uh, show you a little bit of my work, which of course developed uh, here at UT. Um, so uh, today, uh, in part because uh, I have too much to talk about with this book, as you, those who know me know, I can go on. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the industry aspects of uh, my work, uh, specifically as this being part of this kind of global media industries uh, speaker series. I want to just kind of draw uh, some attention to, I think, this kind of larger paradigm of how we look at location, uh, which is, you know, uh, previous to my work, I think, you know, primarily been looked at um, in a lot of avenues as, you know, primarily aesthetic practice, and how we kind of tie the aesthetic part and the industry part together a little bit more closely. Um, so, um, just to give you a kind of overview of the book project as it stands and as it developed, um, you know, really I'm looking at 30 years of uh, Hollywood film and TV series set in San Francisco uh, over a 30 year period. Uh, we're roughly looking at about 130 films and TV series, and uh, I, some of the more familiar titles are shown up here. Uh, everything from you know noirs like Dark Passage, uh, of course Vertigo, really Vertigo, Bullet, and Dirty Harry being arguably, this is what I said I was gonna do. <laughs> Just possessed. Um, Time to get a new keyboard. Um, Um, in a way, San Francisco is really this kind of master case study for looking at what is this time period whereby location shooting went from being a kind of supplement to Hollywood studio soundstage and backlot production um, to instead becoming really kind of the first or, or dominant way of making movies. And you know, we can talk a little bit about whether that is still the dominant. I, I think it is in a, is in a certain extent. Um, but nonetheless, this is a period of time where it really came to the forefront as being the way that people made movies. Um, on screen San Francisco, uh, interestingly enough, uh, undergoes a transition that was much more uh, pronounced than what was happening on screen. So while the city more or less weathered what was an era of urban crisis, urban riots, with its image more or less intact. Um, and in fact, uh, in the late 60s, when of course uh, several cities were experiencing you know, their worst kind of images uh, and their worst kind of you know, scenes of unrest, of course San Francisco becomes this destination with the summer of love. Uh, nonetheless, in only a few short years, San Francisco would more or less befall on screen the same fate that many other cities befell off screen. Um, and so a way of thinking of San Francisco as a location is that it was radically rebuilt to suit uh, a mixture of industry practices, national perceptions of urban culture. So you know, what my perspective on this research was, was rather than saying what do uh, people take out of San Francisco or how does San Francisco inform movies, it was the reverse of that. It was actually Actually looking at how outsiders come to that space, um, what they intend to find in that space, and then what they actually find, and the ways that these kind of industry paradigms and practices are going to predispose filmmakers to choose certain sites over other sites and what they develop. So, um, why was San Francisco kind of at the forefront of this transition? Well, there are, uh, first of all, some iconic films to talk about, so films that had an impact. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in some detail about Bullet today, which is increasingly a film I always return to and really set off a number of things that are still pre prevalent from today, uh, both as a location production and also as a kind of almost, uh, you know, first modern action movie in certain regards uh, made in Hollywood. Um, and also, uh, you know, as a form of urban aesthetics, right, that each of these is kind of, if you will, a a paradigm for how we represent cities and one that gets transported beyond San Francisco into other sites. Um. A unique proximity to Los Angeles in the 1940s were really just at the cusp of the commercial air travel time. So being able to truck things up there, being able to use a train to get things up there, these are actually really important aspects of how this becomes amenable. Um, at the same time too, uh, San Francisco being so visually distinct from Los Angeles, okay? So uh, you know, one of my favorite is like it came from beneath the sea, right? Well, okay, what's the sea monster gonna attack? The Golden Gate Bridge, right? Well, what would the sea monster attack in LA? 
I mean, this is no offense to LA, but it's to say that, you know, there's not, if there's no there there, right, there's not this one singular icon that represents something. Um, am I playing with this? It did. It's a little preview. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, which is to say that um, San Francisco is a, a space that has a visual counterpoint. We'll see this in uh, the first See It Now broadcast by Edward R. Murrow, right? It says, we're all the way cross country. And where's it gonna show? New York and San Francisco, right? It's a visual chord symbol of West Coast kind of refinement, urbanism, you know, California, yada, yada. Um, finally, um, this is a location boom that precedes what we think of as what drives location booms. Um, there are next to no financial incentives at the time. There can't be tax incentives because it's in the state of California. It can't compete in a state-to-state -state basis with Los Angeles. And so it's a proving ground where the kind of rules of the game are very different than how we see them now and where there's not that same net of that, hey, this production was a mess and was really expensive, but the financial incentives bailed us out. Um, finally, it's a city that plays itself. So in contrast to something like uh, Toronto, if we look at, where it's constantly doubling as other places, San Francisco is always more or less San Francisco. It communicates itself and thus uh, has a different role or different kind of representational quality than places that are stand-ins for other places. So um, what I'd start with, um, and which will be kind of the more broader uh, way I'm looking at this work now as I've expanded it to some other things, um, why shoot on location instead of shooting on the lot? Any ideas? Why? Why do it? Realism. Realism, authenticity looks better, okay. Um, why else? Okay, good. Cheaper, more realistic. Okay, these are two most See, I guess uh, two most common uh, responses to why you shoot on location, right? Um, in an industry reason, wow, it's way cheaper to shoot on location. Uh, we don't need to pay for, you know, these giant sets, these giant this or that that are going to cost all this money, okay? And of course, the aesthetic reason, which is assumed to be part of it, um, aesthetic realism, right? Um, I don't have time today, again, to what a tricky term realism is, although we can talk about that a little bit. But by and large, right, this association is really a clear well found out, well thought of in terms of that. Um, but you know, one of the reasons I was interested in this work is that uh, you know, my research into this and some of my intuitions about this followed uh, some different ideas. Um, if it's cheaper to show them location, why'd they build studios? Which is to say, right, that why build massive industrial facilities in order to produce movies if it's more economical to make them low location? Which is to say, location shooting isn't cheaper. It is cheaper for certain types of films, right? It is cheaper compared to, say, certain things, but by and large, the most efficient way to make movies, think about how sitcom is made. You put people in a room that can be set up with cameras and lights and everything, et cetera, et cetera, very easily, and you do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible, okay? You don't have to wait for the weather. You don't have to wait for all of these things. And so um, I want to move beyond this kind of cheapness explanation to look at instead, actually, the way that the expenses of location shooting were made to be uh, you know, able to be overcome by filmmakers. Um, Finally, realism has two questions. One, why are people writing checks for realism? Is realism something that is so attractive, so demanded by audiences um, that they need to move forward? That, that that's the only way that a film can be made. And most of the evidence shows that that's not quite a, a linear progression, okay? So we can see films in the late 1960s, they're still using real projection and people are like up in arms saying, how dare you, this looks so fake, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, that was seen as a version of realism. Um, that was fine and uh, was something that was accepted by viewers, okay? And then finally, of course, a sense of realism, right? Gigi, which mostly shot on location, and Blackboard Jungle, which mostly shot on the Columbia lot, okay? Um, one is far more associated with, say, realism than this one, and so it leads to the question of which types of realism are being dictated, which types of realism are the ones that are gonna allow uh, you know, Hollywood productions to get the green light to shoot on location. And so, um, you know, idea I kind of uh, developed uh, in my edited collection a little bit more, but I want to talk of, uh, it, it's something that's kind of a through line of the monograph as well, is thinking of location shooting as an industrial practice and how you go about it. And looking at 
when to shoot on location as a way of um, overcoming expenses or making things cheaper in really what are uh, oftentimes special cases, okay? So you shoot on location when the cost of set building is gonna be greater than the additional expense of shooting there. Okay, go back to my Golden Gate Bridge example, right? It costs a lot of money to build a convincing version of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's somewhat less expensive to shoot at the actual thing, okay? So landmarks, icons, things that can't be recreated. Yes, okay, so cost of set building could be larger than how expensive it is to send people on location, particularly if you can just send a second unit crew who might be able to capture the backgrounds or get a few shots and then come back to the studio, okay? or the production value is worth it, okay? You know, think of uh, my friend Meryl Schleier has this really nice piece on Niagara, okay? And something like Niagara Falls becomes this wonderful kind of set piece where the whole narrative revolves around it, and obviously another thing that's hard to construct. So the production value is worth the fact that it might cost more to shoot on location. Um, then there's financial incentives, though. If you can, say, use foreign funds to shoot in uh, Europe uh, that are unlocked, and so you can shoot in Europe in the 50s, and 60s, well, who cares that it's a very costly, time-consuming process shooting the movie if the financial incentives more than make up for it. And of course, financial incentives are what dictate, right, crews to inconveniently travel to Australia and all over the world, et cetera, in order to um, make movies. Um, the added expenses add up to a lot of different things. There's a transportation of the various people, and we're talking about crews that could number in uh, over 100 people oftentimes um, in classical Hollywood, a lodging for all those people, which was required in their contracts, um, additional days, not to mention that the days that they are assigned to be off if they're union workers, you need to pay some type of stipend. If things run late, there are penalties that get paid. Uh, if you're shooting in certain places, you have to pay standby workers depending on the union contract so that you're paying people who are put out of work in order for them to shoot on location and uh, weather okay San Francisco a very predictable climate right uh, is somewhere where the weather delays become almost a running kind of comical aside to many of these productions where you know they show up in uh, dark passage started shooting in November and it's like what were you thinking coming to San Francisco in November okay and so this all puts it together um, into like all the factors that can spiral out of control and we think about movies that have kind of spiraled out of control think about how many of these involve locations, okay, whether it's Cleopatra, whether it's Heaven's Gate, whether it's Waterworld trying to shoot on the water, okay, we realize that, you know, in certain extents, location is opening up a certain level of uncertainty into your production. This is a problem if you're trying to make a certain release calendar, if you're trying to put out uh, however many movies a year and this one needs to come in on schedule or can't really outpace because of how much is put into it, the budget that is you know, allotted for it. And so that level of unpredictability, even if you might save money, the kind of uh, downside risk may be greater than the upside risk of saving a few bucks on a unique location production. Um, so what we have really though is an interesting paradigm shift So I would say really hits this crossover point around 1968. Um, soundstage production from the 30s when of course they're called sound stages because we need to uh, have the actual studio uh, controlled, put together in place so that uh, we can record sound. Uh, sound is one of the kind of uh, serious uh, you know, de delimiters of how much this is. We're, of course, Kathy has written for the book some <laughs> wonderful stuff about the ways they still found uh, methods to shoot on location despite all of these kind of difficulties are inherent but by and large um, you know for a standard picture right you really needed a reason to go on location um, particularly if it was going to be a distant location um, finally rear projection and locations were, were a very you know easy supplement and it was really a quite seamless process so you can have a movie like pal Joey uh, it's somewhat forgotten now but one of the more successful San Francisco movies okay and we get a shot of uh, Kim Novak's uh, double most likely getting out of a car on location. We cut directly to a shot of Frank Sinatra, who didn't need to go up to San Francisco for this shot, right? We'll have rear projection in the background to establish him in the same space. And finally, we'll move into this small kind of streetscape on the studio lot. And so a seamless process whereby only the shots that need to be shot at a distant location with a minimum of people brought to said location are the ones that'll be captured there, okay? 
Well, circa 1968, something interesting happens. It's kind of that delta point whereby location shooting becomes something that is uh, comparable in cost when shot the right way to shooting on the studio lot. And we can argue that from the 1970s onward, this paradigm has shifted whereby there's a default sense that for certain scenes, they will be shot on location and the rest of it will be finished at the studio lot. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about whether this is quite the default um, as well um, and it's something to open for conversation. Um, so some of the wrinkles of this have to do with scale of production now. Um, on the one hand, when we have uh, A pictures, okay, where they're gonna have stars and have a certain level of quality associated with them, it's going to be more expensive to shoot that on location. B pictures though, these might be filmmakers who don't own a studio set, who their choice of sets are leftover sets from A pictures or are very repetitive, and who are more willing to compromise what would be seen as you know, cinematography aesthetics in order to grab something exciting. And so hence, they can grab a shot on the street. You know, People might not notice Dennis O'Keefe walking down the street in the way that they notice Humphrey Bogart walking down the street if they want to film him. And hence, there are some economies for the B pictures to grab the occasional location work, mostly around California, which San Francisco is one of those. And indeed, RKO in the 40s did like a series of programmers that more or less would kind of hit a few days in San Francisco and uh, you know get a few locations and come back to the lot. Um, independence, similar difference, okay? They have to pay to rent the studio space. They need to pay most frequently during this era for studio workers to work on their productions. And hence, those are higher expenses where at a certain point they might blanch and say, why don't we just shoot this on location for paying this much to be at another studio, okay? Um, style of production is going to be the other delimiter. Um, what was often referred to as TV style versus Hollywood style was one of the ways that these aspects changed, okay? Um, you know, early filmmakers, I talk quite a lot about Blake Edwards, but other people coming out of TV like John Frankenheimer in the 1960s, okay, had a more fluid style. We're used to working on TV where, oh my God, the budgets were just insane in the 1960s. You're making, you know, a, a, so many episodes in a given year and people learned how to stretch a dollar and to shoot more quickly um, versus a Hollywood style where the number of setups, the number of shoots per day, it's going to be uh, significantly kind of smaller and slower. Um, and what I'd say are variations of a semi-documentary, the famous kind of 1940s films where they're using the newsreel style to go out and shoot uh, you know, true crime stories or true kind of espionage stories in the streets. Um, and then later the kind of verite hinged uh, semi-documentaries of the 60s and 70s, which I would argue still constitute kind of the dominant style of location shooting, um, particularly for police genres, okay? So uh, you know, part of why I think Bullet is interesting is that the style of it in many places looks quite familiar um, in a way that I think the movies that precede it do not in terms of how it shoots a police film on the streets with this kind of you know, uh, nuanced, if you will, kind of semi-documentary style. So what are the other ways that one can lower the cost? Technology, right? Um, this has a kind of knockoff effect throughout um, when one given technology can kind of actually reduce things for another. Um, the biggest for this is film stock. The faster your film stock gets, the less light you need. The less light you need, the less personnel you need, the less equipment you need, the less uh, truck space you need to move this stuff around. And so what we're going to arrive by by the early 70s is that all the major components of film production can be fit into something roughly the size of a Winnebago which I know, you're like really excited to get to the 1970s, like, yes, the Cinemobile, and it's just this big van, okay? Um, the van is not as exciting as the fact that the equipment has all uh, gained a small enough form that is able to be taken on location. Um, similarly, the economics of the studio a lot have changed. Um, hey, you might be making more money renting that space out to television shows who are going to be regular clients and can use the space more efficiently and let your feature films, which fewer are being made by the actual studio, let them go further afield, try their tax incentives, or let independent producers figure it out. Um, I mentioned shooting style, which obviously going to impact it, and I'll kind of give the example of Bullet, how that impacts location shooting. Um, there's the logistics involved as well, okay? Um, 
it amazes me how late into the process hidden camera shooting was an acceptable thing. Um, I've talked to a friend in the law school, and I, I, one day I think I want to research like when the uh, appearance waiver became a de rigueur thing in filmmaking, because you know, for something like the Thomas Crown Affair in the 1960s, they were literally just running and gunning and shooting people on the streets of Boston, and they were more or less like, hey, cool, I'm in a movie with Steve McQueen. Um, no release forms, none of that. Um, you know, so really this kind of uh, what seems today like an amateurish production style was part and parcel of these kind of experimental techniques on that. Um, finally, genre, okay? Um, Westerns were often shot on locations because uh, you can shoot with daylight. You need reflectors rather than lighters for a lot of the shots. Um, California is surrounded by Western locations. So there are certain economies that come from that genre. Um, or a police film whereby um, that becomes so associated with location that it almost becomes de rigueur that you have to shoot that on location. So back to San Francisco, which is one of the comments I get sometimes on the book. But let's get back to San Francisco. Um, San Francisco is, uh, in 67 to 68, kind of at the center of what I'm you know, calling this paradigm shift um, and undergoes a production boom. So I mentioned there being roughly 130 titles I cover in the book. From the, you know, 1945 to around 1967 is about half the titles. The other half more or less come after this moment in 1968. And so in the years between 67 and then really through 1974, it is, you know, nothing short of just a, a giant boom in production. What are some of the factors here? Um, Runaway production has uh, effectively um, had unions for years fighting against uh, labor being taken abroad, using European uh, crews to shoot, using foreign workers to staff Hollywood films. And um, the focus is so clearly on foreign production that, in fact, domestic production is generally celebrated. Um, San Francisco bringing back movies, Al Yoda, uh, mayor of San Francisco, also happened to be running for uh, president at the time or a few years after this, is saying, look, we're bringing our movies back to America, right? This is patriotic that we're moving uh, movies back to here. Um, and indeed, this in some ways was a cover for Los Angeles, which is starting to react to just how many productions are going to New York, to San Francisco, to other locations that the mayors are competing for. Um, the physical lot, which was once the asset that made it that movies should be shot on the studio, is becoming a liability or something that has not as productive a use as it once had, okay? Um, MGM is owned by Kirk Kerkorian now, who is a real estate developer. Um, I don't know if any of you have been out to Culver City lately. It's some valuable real estate. Um, you know, the whole entire place has like become this ur new urban center in Los Angeles, and people are doing the math on it as well. I, Fox found oil on their lot in the 1950s, okay? So these are actually physical spaces that have other productive uses to return on. Um, MGM, interestingly enough, decided to more or less let their back lot fall into disrepair. Um, you know, where they were shooting these kind of grand spectacles in the high classical era, they start shooting uh, you know, uh, movies like Soylent Green because more or less it looks like this burnout wasteland because of the lack of maintenance that's done to the sets, okay? So no longer an asset and one where the real estate values are actually more useful than the values of these as actual economic spaces. Uh, sounds like the story of urban renewal as well, okay? And so the studios are a mini version of that. Um, on the other hand, places like Universal, which had such a huge footprint in television, um, particularly during the Wasserman years, of course, of him coming over from Review, um, you have this um, other dynamic whereby it is such a profitable rental space that why would you waste you know, another TV production that could be on the lot by shooting your own film there? It's more valuable and profitable to send them away. Okay, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier though, the problem is that the fiscal kind of incentive has to make up for the production efficiency, okay? So it's not that Cleopatra didn't get a lot of money and a lot of incentives to shoot in Italy, it's that the uh, cost of how inefficient it was when the production went kind of off the rails and multiplied on location made it so that any savings financially were you know, essentially lost through how inefficient the production was. And so this is a trade-off that's being worked out at this point and one that Bullock kind of finds a way to set the paradigm for. Um, 
I just want to go briefly through the technology. As I mentioned, the faster film stock is like a key part of this. One of the things I find so interesting about this era is that as the studio lots are losing workers or losing standing staff or not becoming this place where you clock in every day and do your job, but are rather becoming this rental space, studios are not as invested in research and development in the same way, okay? Um, while they may have technological partnerships with outside companies as they always do, that day-to-day -day kind of making new rigs, making new camera setups that used to be just like part of a camera department starts to decline. And what you see are, the new tools, the new methods are coming from places where that kind of production efficiency is now needed. Television, uh, you know, particularly television news, industrial filmmaking, uh, commercials. Uh, Bill Fraker, who uh, shot uh, Bullet and also shot Rosemary's Baby, actually talked about how wonderful it was to step away from feature filmmaking to make commercials because the cinematography and commercials he found far more innovative than what was going on uh, in feature films. And indeed, other folks like like Haskell Wexler, Conrad Hall, were all working in commercials as a way to kind of renew what they were doing uh, as cinematographers when the Hollywood paradigm seemed to have grown a bit stale. Once again, European cinema, where uh, portable cameras, shooting on location, starts in some ways as a necessity and becomes a style, becomes a production method whereby you can make things on location for uh, a cheaper cost. Um, and finally, and this has aesthetic implications, um, black and white film um, more or less disappears in 1967 with the decision for the major networks to switch over to all color programming. Um, this basically just kills the value of Hollywood's black and white catalog of films. And basically, you know, other than In Cold Blood and then occasional other films afterwards, more or less ends black and white. And so interestingly enough, when we think of the look of color film of this time, and would argue is still the palette that we'll see in the kind of gritty police show and the gritty cop show, much of this is born out of films that would have traditionally been shot in black and white, whether they're semi-documentary films, whether they're police films, whether they're realist dramas. Um, these are uh, the types of films that were shot with this amazing kind of inky black and white stock that was so much faster than color, and now need to find a different vision visual equivalent, okay? Um, color, which uh, in part because it was so bright and required so much light, um, has this completely different generic association. And so what cinematographers start to do with color is, well, we can't make it higher contrast, but what we can do is make it grainier, less bright, less vibrant, make that be the form of realism. And so see comments of people trying to make the film look ugly, degrading it, okay, um, shooting underexposed and stopping up in films like The French Connection, every way to kind of make color behave in a different way because black and white is no longer an option. All right. So, um, as I said, 68 is kind of the transition year um, that I focus on and that for, is both for San Francisco and I think for Hollywood is really a, a, you know, a watershed in terms of location shooting. Um, both Bullet and Petulia are uh, released in 1968, both by Warner Seven Arts, who has more or less just bought the uh, studio, um, and it's kind of taking things over from you know, the original Warner Brothers uh, management. Um, these are the first two Hollywood films that are shot entirely in San Francisco. Um, they're all shot by uh, British directors, so uh, Richard Lester, who uh, of Hard, Hard Day's Night fame is coming over from uh, British cinema. Uh, Peter Yates is coming over from uh, British cinema as well. So coming over from these European industries used to these types of shooting methods. Um, Petulia is a total box office failure. And has anyone seen Petulia? Yeah, Tom has, and he was like, what's this movie, John Story? <laughs> I, I mean, it's a really fascinating movie and has you know, kind of a cult following at this point, but it really hit flat. Um, nonetheless, for critics, um, was the US nominee for the Cannes Film Festival, which caused some controversy because no one was American who made the film, <laughs> but they shot it in San Francisco with uh, Nick Rogue as a cinematographer, um, Richard Lester running the production, and uh, indeed, Lester seemed like this can't miss commercial quality. And not, and it's this lovely, new, a kaleidoscopic kind of view of San Francisco, right? And it was like, uh-uh, no. I, Bullet is the film that, that really defined the city, defined the era, and really ushered in a huge wave of uh, location-based work there. Um, it's an enormous hit by those standards, um, sets off a, a gigantic boom in location-based police films, 
a boom in San Francisco film. If you take out the police film, San Francisco is not exactly booming with production. Um, that genre becomes almost inextricable from the city. Um, and of course, can be serialized in the streets of San Francisco in the early 1970s. Um, and so Bullet is, in a way, making the paradigm for this new form of location shooting, both as an economic industrial practice and as an aesthetic style. Um, it's just a sample of kind of the level of interest in California at the time. Um, Variety in the LA Times, major, major articles on this. California's Camelot, where everything is happening. Um, there are literally articles tying together the uh, you know, filmmaking boom in San Francisco with the music boom there. Uh, you know, it's like Antonioni's watching movies at the Fillmore West, like your head will explode with how many people are just coming there. Uh, if London was the it town the year before, now it's San Francisco and these British filmmakers are coming over. So just filmmaking is kind of subsumed into to this countercultural explosion of media that's going on in the city. And they're contrasting, indeed, some of the older filmmakers who they say are coming up in these large caravans with newer filmmakers like Woody Allen, like Peter Yates, who are shooting what's considered documentary and TV style, shooting faster and lighter with smaller crews. Um, and those of you who've read uh, Mark Harris's book, what's the name of that book again? It's so lovely. But um, his book on the five best picture nominees. Pic yes. Pictures at a Revolution. Pictures at a Revolution, yeah. Um, so these are some of the uh, pictures that are coming to bear. Um, this is one of those lovely quirks of location. You know, residents of San Francisco will tell you he's going the wrong way on the bridge. But it's perfect, right? The sky is in front of him above. You know, if he was going on the underpass, right, this is not like this revelatory thing to go to Berkeley, OK? And so the sky ahead of us, I'm free. I mean, you know, anyway, all of that kind of sense of spirit. Um, but, but as to my point earlier, right, I mean, another enormously successful movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, um, partly because Spencer Tracy is dying, like they can barely get him up to uh, San Francisco, is shot almost entirely in the studio lot, rear projection, also successful, though, with a different audience and at a point in time where people are starting to say, this looks creaky, this style does not look anything like what we're seeing from The Graduate, what we're seeing from these new films. And so that kind of studio look is, at this point, starting starting to look dated in a different sense. Um, and then we have the hippie exploitation movies, of course. Um, we have Preminger's bizarre take on this, which is a, uh, anyone who wants to watch an acid comedy with Jackie Gleason, uh, be my guest. Uh, took me a while to get through that one. <laughs> Not as good as it sounds. Um, but right, you know, just the kind of entire mise-en-scene of the summer of love. Um, I, I think actually the exploitation filmmakers do it better. So uh, Richard Rush's Psych Out with, you know, Jack Nicholson and Dean Stockwell there in full hippie garb. Uh, indeed, I've even seen, I forget if it was that one where I saw like a Nazi uh, biker jacket that they just put psychedelic colors on so they could double that as the hippie mise-en-scene as they switched from biker movies to hippie movies, okay? I mean, this is the level of just hop in and exploit this cultural event. Um, they come, they shoot the sign of Hate ashbury and they go home and shoot it on the lot, which was still much cheaper. Um, Bullet is up to something different, though. Um, Bullet is the first movie to use Aeriflex cameras, which had been designed primarily as, you know, action sequence cameras. These are portable reflex viewing cameras. So you actually see what you're shooting while you're shooting the movie. Um, the problem, why they didn't use those all the time, is they're extremely noisy, okay? And so Bullet is gonna mix these shots with cameras mounted on everything, you know, the front of the car, back of the car, in the car, um, you know, with, uh, you know, every type of shot um, in terms of, you know, pans, tilts, everything. Um, logistically, this is the only the type of movie you can make during this time when San Francisco is like, wow, yeah, come make movies here, okay? And they were shooting, uh, blocking off four or five blocks at a time with little notice. Policemen are going door to door because San Francisco is not a place where you have driveways. Cars pull right out into the street. And so going door to door in case some poor person pulls out into one of these car chases. And they're shooting uh, almost a month on this car chase. And Warner sees the footage, and they see cars moving around, cars moving around, some from weird angles, et cetera, et cetera. And like, this is nuts. You, you 
come back to the backlot. She's on the backlot. Like, why did we ever approve this? And Steve McQueen says, no, like what we're doing here works well. Gets out of his contract with uh, Warner Seven Arts based on how uh, frustrated they are with Bullet seeming to be this location, you know, uh, disaster. Um, meanwhile, Frank Keller, the editor who wins the editing award for this movie, is editing the dailies on location so he can send the uh, filmmakers back out or say what's working, it's not. And the action sequence of Bullet, which it's easier to forget the rest of the film, the 20-minute car chase, um, which more or less um, not only redefines a kind of action sequence, and indeed is like the Ur Fast and the Furious, um, but is also um, shown in its entirety on uh, late night television. So they basically show it as almost its own film um, on late night TV. Bolt becomes an enormous hit, enormous success, and the number of in, uh, imitators are myriad. Um, interestingly enough, too, Bolt is this hedge between um, Where's that? I had that poster earlier, but right, it's like Steve McQueen is this complex, like new Hollywood figure. He's often like looking in the mirror and very like you know, confused. He's part counterculture. He wears turtlenecks and goes to cool cafes, and you know, he's part like kick-ass cop. And, and and this hybrid really works in a way that kind of hedges both the bets of a new style and a new way of doing things. Um, you know, it may seem pretentious in retrospect, but McQueen is citing De Sica. He's citing Antonioni as the realism that he is going for in Bullet. And now, well, we might not think of it as a movie with the same kind of uh, intellectual heft as these you know, filmmakers or, or you know, movies by them. Um, but the same token, it is that similar style, the idea that we can extract from this location, from this reality, the sense of kind of uh, meaning. And indeed, the excitement of Bullet is precisely that these cars are going by what are obviously real places. And that sense of danger, that sense of momentum, that sense of even just being in San Francisco Cisco um, is palpable in a way that had not been before. Um, ironically, though, the cars are moving so fast, you really don't see San Francisco. I, I mean, if you think about Bullet, like where in San Francisco, I mean, residents love to say, oh, wait, that's there, and then they cut here and things like that. I mean, you have no sense of it as an actual organized place. We have a sense of it is as this almost like action theme park, if you will, where the hills become. Um, these types of uh, you know, obstacles. And, and, and in some ways, it's really almost like LA come to San Francisco, right? Like San Francisco becoming the ultimate driving fantasy for uh, you know, Angelinos. Um, there are limits to what Bullock can do on location, though. Um, this is a great shot. She is the woman who donated her mansion to uh, shoot on location, OK? And so she has this lovely cameo when they're doing a party for uh, Robert Bond's character, who is the uh, you know, senator who's kind of you know, running for re-election. And so this is how you secure a mansion in San Francisco, is you give people cameos in it. Petulia was like in all the Who's Who magazines of like, oh, this it couple is dancing at you know, the Fairmont so that they could secure the locations. Um, but perhaps more interesting from aesthetic reason is one of this. Um, this is a hospital. What's wrong with this picture? OK. <laughs> why, why does it look like a hospital? <laughs> OK. Well, you see these windows. This is daylight, right? I mean, I think you'd probably lose your license for having this poorly lit a hospital, um, which is to say that to get this kind of look that we associate with a certain cinematic realism on location that Bullock's developing is pushing the film stock beyond what it can actually do, OK? And it's actually, in an odd way, creating was a completely unrealistic lighting scheme that is justified by the kind of generic associations and the sense that I'm in a real hospital, even though no real hospital would be this darker look this way. Um, so just to do a brief bit, I know I said so the talk was like, I, I put more things than I could get to. So <laughs> a quick bit on urban aesthetics. Um, you know, the two paradigms that I think are really important uh, in this book and I think are really important to this period of location shooting is this oscillation between what I call cine-tourist cine kind of aesthetic of, you know, cinema sightseeing. Of course, this has a long history. Jennifer Peterson does great work on, you know, travelogues and the silent uh, cinema and, and how much, you know, cinema was born out of this sense. And it's renewed 
you through different processes. So, you know, the move towards color and widescreen, you know, so you've seen the Golden Gate Bridge, but you haven't seen it in Cinerama with a plane flying over it. All of a sudden, these locations become reactivated as spectacles due to a new exhibition technology. Um, even something like Vertigo is really a lovely tour of San Francisco. You know, it's like some murders and some strange, you know, sexual politics, but nonetheless, you know, you see the Coit Tower and you see the Art Museum and, you know, it is a tour of the city. Um, and Bullet in its own right is the same, right? You extend this car chase all the way across into the larger bay with this kind of vehicular momentum and we have this kind of tourist aesthetic. Well, the breaking point though in America for urban representation is Watts and the summers of riots that occur afterwards and there's really almost like just a, a, a schism between the sense of cities is yes, maybe they're struggling and maybe they're run down, but the centers of civilization to really cities as the end of civilization, the frontier overrun in a certain sense. And indeed, um, you know, something I toy with in the manuscript and I can talk about a little bit at some other level is the way that uh, the Western, which is fading and becoming somewhat extreme in the work of Peck and Paw, gets subsumed into the police genre. And of course, Dirty Harry being the salient example of that, um, which Eastwood om openly described as being kind of like a Western, um, which uh, more or less the rough draft for Dirty Harry is Coogan's Bluff, where he's literally a cowboy detective from Arizona who's in the city. And so um, indeed the city becomes this kind of space of a frontier, a wasteland, a, a place where you know, there is no law and there's kind of you know, new people have to roam through. And so this emphasis on red light districts, um, this is the final shot from Dirty Harry when our killer's in the cesspool that uh, Dirty Harry throws his badge into and we zoom out on just this like massive wasteland of kind of like a disused quarry and it's like yeah this is your city now right a space that is essentially was once civilization is now going to seed. With the success though of these police films, this gets reinforced over and over and over again. And indeed, as Manhattan is reaching a kind of nadir, particularly in some of its entertainment districts like Times Square, this aesthetic gets easily transported to San Francisco. And so the French Connection, which is produced by the same producers as Bullet, you know, wins the Academy Award and wins the Cinematography Awards for its work of this bleak, colorless, desaturated kind of palette of New York as place spinning out of control, depopulated, uh, you know, rampant with crime and just disuse, okay? And we see this mirrored in San Francisco films, whether it's the conversation, um, whether it's a somewhat brighter, it's still TV, okay, it's gonna be a little brighter, the image, but uh, Streets of San Francisco, where we can see uh, in the premiere, it's gonna be the Golden Gate Bridge, of course, with the dead body in front of it, um, which is the same motif that's shown in Dirty Harry in more macabre fashion. And uh, the Laughing Policeman, which if you haven't seen seen it, you need to take a shower if you watch it. I mean, just like a level of just grime and sleaze that, that is just being embraced and is being associated with the city where it's like all cops do, when cops are not on the street doing something questionable, they're in strip clubs. I mean, every type of kind of scenario is put to show the city as this kind of, you know, fallen Babylon. Um, that said, um, by 1975, or 74 in this case, um, we have some interesting signs of it, that paradigm kind of shifting away. And you know, we think about, of course, uh, you know, post-Jaws Hollywood. Um, Towering Inferno is actually an earlier entry into that you know, renewed blockbuster uh, aesthetic. Uh, Towering Inferno uh, shot with uh, three different units, actually. There was a uh, location unit that had one director. There was um, a helicopter unit, I believe. Gosh, I'm getting fuzzy on this. But uh, the main other unit, which was done by uh, the producer, uh, is, is essentially being shot uh, in Hollywood because the story of Towering Inferno is that they build the world's tallest skyscraper in San Francisco, and shockingly, it goes wrong. And, you know, the big fire, of course, and so you can't build the world's tallest skyscraper in San Francisco and burn it down. It's probably logistically demanding. Um, and, and so this type of spectacular uh, sequence, story, high concept, if you will, um, demands that on the one hand, we have this sense of realism established on location. We'll shoot you know, these large crowds outside what's the bottom of the Hyatt. But then we're going to start using, uh, in this case, mostly physical effects, but also optical effects to put in the rest. And so this move towards these kind of more high concept films 
kind of rebalances in a way is kind of uh, shows this shifting tide back to more of a hybrid approach where, yes, we're still going to you know, continue through the 1970s and have a lot of auteur cinema by you know, folks like Scorsese and Altman still exploring this kind of total location shooting. But there's another thread of the kind of nascent blockbuster era that's going to balance that kind of realism you get from shooting on location with the need to control the digital, the special effects that are going to you know, make your film or going to sell your spectacle. Um, and so to leave it at that point, so I can leave some time for Q&A, um, you know, one of the things I think about now, um, and uh, you know, Julian Stringer writes about this a bit in uh, you know, our edited collection, it's something I, I continue to kind of return to, trying to give this a kind of more contemporary media industries paradigm, but where is that balance? And, and in a way, I feel like we, we've returned to that studio hybrid, whereby you shoot on location what is going to give you the maximum impact. So it's the streets and casbahs of Morocco or whichever site that they choose to shoot for Bond to create that world traveling kind of exotic milieu, but that the spectacle of what is happening is too big to be accomplished in reality. And so one needs to return to the lot, not for the studio interiors that used to be what it did or the rear projection stages, but rather for the green screens, for the high technology indeed, to the post-production facilities where you can create this once again hybrid between um, the kind of you know, appeal of locations and the appeal of special effects. And so we see in a way in this contemporary era this return to this rebalancing between the kind of excitement, unpredictability, and realist associations of location shooting with the ultimate control of being able to craft these environments through digital effects. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Television is like the definitive factor for why Hollywood studios stop making black and white films. I mean, you see other eras where it ebbs and flows based on anticipating different things, but it just comes to a screeching halt because of how dependent Hollywood is on the value of selling their films to television. The prices for that keep going up. And so more or less, they're going, wait, part of how we factored in the budget for this film is a sale to television. If television's old color, they're not going to, all color, they're not going to want to pay, especially in the first years of all color for a black and white film. And, and then so it, it's directly tied to television, yeah. And there's a nice, what's his name, Gareth, uh, gosh, so it's getting fuzzy on this, but uh, Gareth Kindham, or th there's, a, there's a few people who've written like nice historiography. It's a number of years ago, but on that, and you can literally see like a graph of that kind of, you know, change, yeah. Hey, Kathy. Was there, I'm, I'm curious, Oh, were there entrepreneurs in San Francisco um, uh, uh, creating rental place? I mean, you know, um, yes. not only uh, Alito uh, welcoming them to the city, but a kind of industrial infrastructure to help San Francisco become this. Um, so, so it's a reactive infrastructure. So they have some infrastructure largely from how many television commercials are shot in San Francisco. What they don't have is a professional soundstage. And so there are going to be various people. And indeed, Aliotto f uh, forms this kind of film commission, although he keeps it at arm's length because this is someone who literally every time the, the Hollywood people come to town, he wants to wine and dine the producers. He's making actual like trips down to Hollywood. He turns this in. Francisco Film Festival and more or less just a way to seduce people to shoot on location in San Francisco. And so he has a strong like direct hand in this. Um, but the people who are also trying to uh, get involved are, um, there's a woman named Ann Brebner who runs all the extras in San Francisco and she's a big voice on the film commission. There's local union reps who of course are invested in there being more production. And of course there's the attention of downtown businesses, right? I mean, the uh, you know, last chapters of this book are San Francisco growing really weary of location production. You can imagine in a peninsular city that already has traffic and parking problems, how difficult it is for them to maintain the level of film production that happens 
particularly when Streets of San Francisco is there, and they're, so they're constantly there making episodes blocking off traffic, and they lose Herb Kane, which is never a good thing, and so Herb Kane is writing off these devilish columns, basically saying, you know, what's Alioto doing? You know, he's basically blocking our traffic so they can make San Francisco look horrible like in Dirty Harry, and so, so there's actually like, a, I mean, it's so San Francisco, right? And since they're not as dependent on the money as some other cities, I mean, there is a, a, an open rebellion between different factions who are saying, let them make their movies somewhere else, right? We don't need this. And so, but back to your initial question, they're starting to develop the infrastructure, but it never quite reaches the level where it's worth it. Um, almost all the film is developed back in Hollywood still. Um, and even, you know, I mean, this is Coppola's dream, right? We'll start American Zoetrope here and we'll have our own type of studio. And I mean, ironically, like, so Lucas's THX, how, I forget the last digits, but anyway, his uh, THX film is made. Um, and the first thing they realize is we can't shoot this thing in location. We need to rent studio space uh, to, in order to do this kind of, you know, sci-fi uh, picture. And so um, there, it never gets to a point where there's a stable kind of infrastructure that doesn't make it worth again with the proximity coming back to Los Angeles to the things that Los Angeles does best uh, in particular post-production, right? I mean, even his state-of-the-art, like a really good sound editing facility is up there, but um, you know, it's not really until like Lucas and Marin County has you know, his own kind of thing going where they can do professional level post-production um, outside of Los Angeles. Yeah, thank you for this. This is wonderful. I have a question about the uh, like the ethics and the legality sometimes when you move into certain areas mm -hmm. of, of depicting uh, certain locations. So like, for example, in the 70s, if you're going to do like what Paul Schrader does in Hardcore, you're just going to track through a street and see all of these sleazy yes. exteriors of foreign theaters and stuff like that. And you depict it in a really nightmarish way. Mm -hmm. would, would he need to get a permit from each of these various, or like get the permission of each of these companies to depict them in this way? Or does he have, if he's just shooting exteriors, would he be able to just line it up and depict it however he? You know, my sense is for exteriors, unless it's a majorly featured exterior, I saw no evidence of people being turned away or blocked. Um, but this is where the mayors come in are really important, right? Alio Odo wants to make it easy for you to shoot in San Francisco. And so he is getting you to the right permitting agencies in order to get these locations. Or he'd say something to the effect of, I mean, San Francisco is it's such a maze of different, like, you know, the bridge is run by one, one uh, you know, commission, the airport's run by another, and so, you know, oftentimes it'd be like, hey, we can't shoot on the Golden Gate Bridge, but you can shoot on the Bay Bridge, or you can't shoot there, but you can shoot there, and um, indeed, there's also local police officers who are more or less highly involved in kind of setting up where you can and can't shoot, so it's harder to find, and particularly again, the 70s, it's an issue. In the 40s, I, I can go to the Warner's archives, and I can see the permits, I can see most of the time they got permission, but mostly if they were going to have to actually, like, put something up or build there. Um, that said, there's just plenty of evidence of run and gun filmmaking at the time that was acceptable and allowed. And in part because these are independent productions, there's a union exception for movies that are made under a million dollars, and they kind of just let these young filmmakers go as long as they stayed under that budget. And the oversight was not quite there in terms of it. And again, I mean, this does, you know, in a way, bite Hollywood um, a little bit in terms of, you know, they would just blow location. So you know, I had that piece recently in the Velvet Light Trap, but like no one could shoot in Chinatown after the killer elite until like it was 20 years because they came into Chinatown. They said, You're good. there's gonna be no parking here. There's no facilities for people. There's a lot of like, you know, new immigrants coming in. There's a lot of violence going on. They're like, I don't care. We're gonna shoot in Chinatown. <laughs> they block everything off. You know, it causes this huge public resistance. Um, we see similar thing happen with Fort Apache in the Bronx and that shoots in New York. And so really the kind of community uh, standing against this stuff starts to happen more and more. Um, you know, in my book, I also document the fact like people were way more accept when in Pacific Heights they chipped the steps on the park shooting this goofy chase for What's Up Doc. It's like the most innocuous movie they made in San Francisco during that era. Um, but meanwhile, they're like shooting at, I mean, stuff in Dirty Harry is shot on the streets, they're actually shooting out that Jesus says sign, and like there's glass shattering, and there's like cars crashing because they're distracted by what's going on. But that's like around North Beach and other areas, and they're kind of like, yeah, should live in a nicer neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really, there was not a sense of that we're going to shut it down in the way that this was like front page news. How dare they chip the steps at you know Alta Plaza? That's just you know the lowest of the low. Yeah. Yes. Hi. 
I'm a different question. Yes. I'm, to, I'm not going to ask the question that I didn't ask you yet. I think there is. Why not? Yeah, well, uh, I'd rather not ask that. But yes. I'd ask it, but I'd not ask it. Um, but slightly different. What happens to the future of this? Well, so two things. Well, two, two different kinds of questions. I'm called the speculator. San Francisco is the Facebook is gay life. Yes. And so we've got like in terms of how you look, it's slightly later. But uh, so I was curious about that because it's not psychedelic, but it's also very much more fun. Yes. So then the second question is totally different, which is the end of the book ends not with you, but I think it ends with the last black man standing. Ah, yes. Which is about the impossible, impossible cost of living in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Which is about real estate in San Francisco. And that the film is sentimental. I'm not really fond of it. But it it, it hits a spot, right? It hits a spot that is like immense gentrification. Yes. In, in Soma and, you know, it's not in here where half of it is. It's open, but yeah, it's in Castro, it's not. So, um, yeah, so two different kinds of questions. One is, I know it's been industry studies, and I know you've done that part of it. From the speculation of thinking about it in relationship to real estate speculation, which is what the last black man standing is. And yes. And a whole bunch of films, which, well, there's a scholarship from Argentine films and my own work on real estate and film, which has to work out. And of course, coming back to how we look at this, which means. It's the latest one, but they must have been films. And my archive, I don't know the archive. So this is where, and I agree. Yes. And it is, I, there's no question about it, and that divide between the commercial and the avant-garde is something that, some stylistically, right? I mean, you watch something like Patchouli, and clearly, like Lester is looking at. I mean, some of the. I mean, there's almost like Bruce Connor esque kind of things that he's doing in there. And so there is an engagement with the avant garde, and it's a piece that um, I didn't find the space to do or to do justice to. But you're absolutely right, and that is where that gay culture is premiering. It, it premieres and it appears in Dirty Harry in this very frank way. There's like a notorious scene in that where Dirty Harry is chasing Scorpio around and he gets you know basically so a man tries to pick him up in the park and so it's like this almost you know descent into you know this conservative nightmare of San Francisco where it's like first he has to he's in the car and now he has to take public transit and now he's running into people who are homeless and now he's being you know solicited by a man in the park and, and you know and similar you know basically Scorpio has him at his will and so there are these really kind of you know that is clearly put together and in fact they'll ironically say in the paper a bit of local color, you know, about that scene in Dirty Harry. And so, but only by that point did I really see much of it. And it, it's largely invisible. Um, simply the beats are almost entirely invisible. They made one Jack Kerouac movie called The Subterraneans and shot it as a musical on the MGM lot. And it's like, it's one of the more bizarre things to have. You have like these happy beatniks like skipping down the studio, you know, um, main fair. And, and so that one of the amazing things is just how little of the culture that's actually going on finds its way to what are these films that are, if you will, the commercial version of it. Um, getting back to your second question, though, how is both participating in that urban process as well as, I think, you know, justifying it? Um, one of the best places to shoot would be in zones that were slated for urban renewal. In fact, uh, on Killer Elite, they basically said, hey, we need to blow up a building. They said, let me check where we're not using the buildings. And so they're like, they're like we'll blow this building up for you if we could do it on camera rather than waiting for you to do it. Um, partly why San Francisco is a site for Italian Inferno is because San Francisco at this time is building a skyline that it didn't used to have. You know, They called it San Francisco's vertical earthquake at the time. And so there are these really interesting kind of uh, separate threads of that. Um, but certainly there reaches a point where this kind of police in San Francisco image becomes, you know, I, I think of almost like the point where it's full house and you're like going over the Golden Gate Bridge and San Francisco is just this chummy place. Mrs. Doubtfire, okay, these 90s films in San Francisco and the city has become something else, right? Um, and But it follows the same national trajectory of these kind of New York romantic movies that are overtaking these other visions of the city, which I put roughly in the 90s, you know? I mean, the 80s, you can still see something like in Adventures of Babysitting 
thing where it's like the suburban fear of the city and oh my gosh, what could happen there? Um, but but by the 90s, it's almost a re-romanticism of it, I'd argue. So is that helpful? I mean, they're part of the force, right? They show why the city needs to be gentrified. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. I'm interested. Sorry, No, and I and, and you know, right, you pick your battles, and that's one where I'm really excited to see where other people pick up. And uh, you know, part of choosing San Francisco and choosing this study was was this outsider's image of the city, and and so in a way too, it's that to acknowledge these films that are being produced locally by people who understand the city or showing the city was the opposite of what I was trying to achieve in this book, which is in a way is to show what happens when people pre-decide what I can extract from the city in terms of the visual text and where do they gravitate, what neighborhoods do they choose to shoot in and not choose to shoot in. And so in that sense, oh, right, the, the, the people who are actual San Francisco natives making films are you know, in a way doing something that's the opposite of the process I was hoping to kind of uncover, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any questions? I actually have one that's kind of a, uh, a question that I That the the notion of San Francisco the proximity, same state, et cetera, et cetera, but it's a, such a different world in so many ways. But uh, I'm thinking of Pixar. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of PDI. Yes. Right, DreamWorks, and you know th th that uh, ironically, mm -hmm. films that don't involve you know cinematography of the area at all, but are so crucial to the, the whole Bay Area, Silicon Valley, and and how much you know that that, that whole. Uh, you know, the computer generated imagery and, and uh and computer animation, how much it wound, winds up being based in San Francisco area. Do you see that as related at all to what you're doing here or is that just a kind of odd coincidence in terms of this other Hollywood North that you've all decades earlier? Right. It's not out of I mean, because they're part and parcel, right? I mean Coppola so is such a tech head who's Pixar, right. Yeah. And, and so when you look at the, and even, you know, I've been doing some research into this, you know, editing project that I'm working on, it's the same thing. The people who are invested in these new technologies are circling around San Francisco, and, and Coppola is like the guru of that, right? Um, you know, one of, partly why I wanted to do some work on, I'm, you know, I'm looking into another project on the transition from, uh, you know, analog editing to digital editing and all that that changes. And so, but partly why I was interested in that is it's the late 70s, you're starting to see the flatbed editing machines and you're starting to see the coverage of these tech expos and like Coppola is going to Germany and bringing back the new tools that are showing off that and it's trying to create, uh, you know, as John Lewis has documented, this electronic cinema. And, Lu and Lucas and Coppola, of course, have such an intimate relationship and he's such a key figure in that. Um, similarly as well, right, this is where San Francisco is beacon, right? They can pull these tech people from Caltech. And, and so in, in a way, this kind of, yeah, this urban, you know, gentrified, kind of techified San Francisco, right, is, you know, matches with that infrastructure as well. Um, but it's amazing, like, how many people work for Lucasfilm, because just they saw Star Wars, and they're like, I gotta work for this guy. I'm a computer person, I gotta work for him, because he's the guy who made Star Wars. And uh, so that is enough. So his, he has one foot in this earlier moment, if you will, and, and you know, again, I mean, such ironies between him and Coppola, where Lucas is able to realize that in the way that Coppola could never uh, do in terms of having this viable commercial, you know, studio infrastructure. Yeah. Pixar, I mean, I, the representations of like San Francisco-ish and Pixar are fascinating uh, to me, so. All right, well, that's, uh, that, that, I think that's about enough. Uh, <laughs> and, uh,
Are beers across the street home and long on me? You want to come over and have a have a have a beer with Scott? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Ah. Thank